Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the HEN uh, Academy Lecture Series. Reconstructing the Future, Cities as Carbon Sinks. This is the title of tonight's lecture, and I'm very excited to introduce our speaker, Professor Dr. Philipp Misselwitz. Philipp, you are the Executive Director of Bauhaus Earth. Bauhaus Earth was founded in 2019, and um, you have the ambition to transform the building sector from a driver of crisis into a creative force for regeneration. Uh, it's very much along our lines, uh, I, can, I can tell. You aim towards a future where our buildings proactively contribute to climate restoration and actually have a positive impact on the planet. Philip is an architect and urban planner. He studied at the Cambridge University and the AA in London and received his PhD from the University of Stuttgart. Since 2013, he holds the chair of Habitat Unit at the Technical University in Berlin and is partner of the design studio Urban Catalyst. Philip, thank you very much for coming. The lecture will be followed by a panel discussion with Giovanni Betti, who is the head of sustainability um, here at HEN and a guest professor of digital experimental design at the UDK, also in Berlin, um, my humble self and um, our dear guests. And the panel will be moderated by Marlene de Saussure, who is the head of public affairs and strategy at Bauhaus Earth and also lectures at the Center for Metropolitan Studies um, at the Technical University uh, Berlin. I'm very much looking forward to um, your talk, Philip, and to um, a lively discussion with all of you afterwards. Please, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. So I, have, I was told I have to stop before the football game begins. Um, I will try that. Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm an architect, as, as I was introduced as, um, and uh, caught in academia, teaching, and uh, urban design, planning. But about a year ago, a little bit more than a year ago, I decided to change and become the co-managing director of Bauhaus Earth, together with John Schellenhuber, who is a pretty well-known climate scientist who initiated this idea. And, uh, and this was quite a jump for me uh, to come from quite a cozy sort of architecture planning bubble uh, and engage with uh, climate scientists who think completely differently, actually. Um, they work with numbers and do quantitative studies and simulations, and they're interested in big, big theories and um, equations and models uh, to change the world. And for me, this is a kind of ongoing, really rich um, experience. <clears throat> and I'm trying to sort of bring this kind of bigger narrative back to architecture. And um, we haven't quite got there yet, but I will try to make it somehow palatable uh, to you and hopefully engage in a good discussion. So where do we come from? What, what is this... Uh, primary narrative of Bauhaus Earth, it definitely begins with the climate crisis. I think everybody knows about it somehow. And, uh, but the drama of it and the seriousness of it um, is sort of something we'd like to put to one side and get on with life uh, as it is. But in not in all environments, it's actually possible. This is a an image of Jakarta and this feeble wall that is actually protecting it from rising sea levels. You may have heard that it's actually planned to relocate this entire city of almost 20 million people, um, which will probably not happen, but uh, very fragile, uh, in a very fragile situation. And also in Germany, of course, about uh, a year and a half ago, there was major flooding with a lot of death. Um, we experienced forest fires in around Brandenburg, almost 400. Um, so we have everywhere kind of brittle uh, systems that 
where, where the climate pressures can, can be felt and no longer ignored. Of course, we have a global process of recognizing that and establishing some kind of procedures like the Paris Climate Agreement in 2015, which was a, a great moment, a kind of euphoric moment where we thought, well, you know, maybe, maybe, just maybe we recognize the seriousness of this stuff just in time to make transformation somehow uh, workable. <clears throat> but progress is not really seen on the ground. The building sector is still the most significant anthropogenic environmental disturbance. Even during corona, it was actually the only sector with all the slowdowns we had during the corona period that did not meet the climate targets in Germany and in Europe. We know that almost 40% of climate gases are emitted in the way we build and plan and design. Uh, not even speaking about waste and, uh, and the rest of it. And we, last year we crossed a very crucial threshold. Some scientists calculated that actually on the planet we now have more so-called anthropogenic mass the stuff that cities are made of, asphalt, concrete, metal, bricks, then biomass. So you have to imagine in a sense that we managed to turn our planet into a body where most limbs are artificial. And if you add all the political commitments that were made by nation states globally, we end up in this bluish cloud somewhere with a global warming by the end of the century between 2.7 and 3.1 degrees, which as anyone who is familiar with this topic would tell you is not a range where we can survive as a civilization as we know it. <clears throat> and the IPCC is acutely aware where the emissions come from. You have here the piling up of all the major emission sectors um, energy, buildings, transport, industry, et cetera, et cetera, on the left. And we know that in order to meet the climate goals of Paris of 1.5 degree warming, we would need to be very, very rapidly approaching zero emissions, sort of global net zero situations by 2050 at the very latest. So we have this red curve there in the middle of the graph that shows where we need to get to. And, and after that, it's a question of actually producing negative emissions in order to um, keep the, the, the climate, uh, the, the, the global warming at 1.5 degrees. And the IPCC has all kinds of ideas of where such negative emissions could come from. But all this, what you see there in dark blue and green, are uh, geoengineering technologies that have not really been invented and tested yet and are very likely to mess further with natural systems. Interestingly, building and the built environment is not really considered to be part of the solution. So you have this gray graph that is um, starting as a major emitter, but then sort of going to zero in the hope that we can actually decarbonize the building sector, but it's not part of the solution. And this is where Bauhaus Earth, which was set up in 2019, um, the idea was born in 2019, it was set up in 20, um, 2020. Um, this is where, where we start. This graph shows basically a timeline of 350 million years. Let me just, you know, architects and you can kind of read uh, drawings like this. So let me quickly explain this to you. Can I use the pointer? Yeah. So this section actually covers 350 million years. What happened is that 350 million years ago, the Earth climate was much, much, much warmer and very carbon rich impossible to be inhabited by humans. Um, so over 350 million years, nature turned the, uh, the planet habitable. Mainly forests took through sequestration, photosynthesis took carbon out of the atmosphere um, and reduced temperatures and created this carbon pool underground of fossils, which we managed to spend in the last 250 years of industrial revolution. So in an extremely short time span, we blew all this, what nature 
took down over 350 million years. We blew this into the atmosphere. So this is where we are. And building materials, the stuff that you all know about and you use on a daily basis, masonry, concrete, steel, composite materials, is a major, major kind of part of this. So cities, the industrial cities with their extractive, wasteful kind of economies and lifestyles are basically the main culprits in the climate space. So how do we turn those culprits into heroes? Can, can cities, can building be part of the solution? And this is what we argue. We, we argue, and I will go through this through a series of examples, we argue that we radically need to change the materials and the processes uh, with which we built and through which we built. We need to remember how humanity has existed for millennia and, um, and use and go back to bio-based materials wherever we can and using fossil-based materials just where, just where we absolutely need it and even those need decarbonization. <clears throat> this is a kind of business as usual scenario, and I will go through some, some of these figures later on. When we consider global building demands until 2050, we are very likely to produce more than 70 gigatons of carbon, which, which is most of the, more than the carbon budgets that we have actually to, to go to climate neutrality. When we change to bio-based materials, and this is not just wood, and I will explain that, we will not only avoid those emissions, but we will substitute carbon emitting materials with carbon storing materials. And this is creating negative emissions worth 70 gigatons. And this alone could actually play a major part in climate healing. So what kind of, what kind of horizon do we need as to think of to make this kind of transition possible. Um, what we need to think of is where materials come from. And I start here on the left of the drawing, back to what I already mentioned, the sophisticated processes by which nature can draw carbon from the atmosphere. So we have here um, just a representation of a biosphere, which could be uh, uh, forests around Brandenburg that have the potential to draw carbon. And <clears throat> the idea would be to, rather than letting um, uh, larger trees then rot in the forest and re-emit the carbon, to cut trees just at the right moment or to harvest agroforestry products um, and a whole range of products and bring them into the building cycle so that the carbon that is stored through natural processes remains there. And in the process, by bringing sequestered carbon through materials as banks of carbon into the built environment and keeping it there as long as possible, we can actually turn cities and buildings into carbon sinks and create a kind of uh, forest building pump that would incentivize an investment in forests um, to uh, an investment in afforestation, it would ideally replenish and stabilize the fragile bios biosphere um, and, and create more biosphere to sequester carbon. So, so this is a kind of complicated systemic uh, framework in which we need to think change. And this is where, coming back to architects and planners, this is of course where we are intensely needed. Um, if this is really going to turn into a kind of regenerative, bio-based kind of circular economy, we need to think about, well, how, how do we bring bio-based materials into cities uh, for ref retrofitting, for adaptation, reuse of buildings, also new build wherever we have to, um, and keep this material without, in the end, um, uh, using it for... Uh, uh, using it for energy, meaning uh, burning it, keeping it there as long as possible in order to actually produce the results that we want. So this is the, this is the aim, this is our kind of core narrative and we call it a kind of systemic transformation towards a regenerative built environment to turn cities and buildings from villains to heroes in the climate uh, story. 
And this, these are the elements that we need to think of, and we don't usually capture those, all those elements. As architects, certainly not. So we need to align ourselves with other, others who can. And the story starts here at protecting natural carbon sinks and the biodiversity that goes with it and use natural sophistication, nature sophistication for carbon sequestration. Bringing this material into cities, um, inventing new material practices and economies to turn the built environment into man-made carbon sinks for substitution um, of uh, negative uh, of uh, materials such as concrete and steel and, and storage. And through this process, turn cities from kind of base, being based on extractive, linear, wasteful economies into regenerative systems. But thirdly, and this is crucial, to mobilize all our skills and sophistication to do this process in an integrated and inclusive way because this kind of transformation has the potential to blow our societies apart. And if you don't think about this in a pro-poor and inclusive way, it will fail. So who is Bauhaus Earth? <clears throat> we are a bunch of uh, crazies who kind of jump uh, into this project. Uh, we barely have an office. We are adapting currently a actually fossil um, uh, infrastructure, uh, a former gas works in the south of Berlin into an office and uh, a workshop. So uh, many young people joined us. We are more than 16 now. Um, and uh, John Sheldon and I are the managing directors. Some of the colleagues are actually here. Um, I've, I've seen them before. And we, we are developing um, different working formats. We are developing a scientific think tank. We are developing a, a maker space, a lab, and various formats of advocacy and learning that I want to introduce. But the core idea, and I apologize for the slide being in German, the core idea is to sort of somehow reference the original Bauer's idea as an interdisciplinary think tank that works towards tools and uh, concepts for a, a revolution in the way we built. And of course, the historical Bauhaus uh, was all about discovering uh, uh, prefabrication and the possibilities for, uh, of, of industries in the early 20th century to, to get uh, these uh, collapsing urban environments um, and reinvent them. Our, our core topic is climate change and all the kind of collateral and uh, entangled kind of questions that, that come with it. So what does the think tank do? I already mentioned the broader narrative is really to develop these uh, missing tools and gaps uh, that we need for this transformation and to make this our arguments less ideological and kind of uh, emphatic and enthusiastic but put, put really sort of numbers and evidence uh, behind this to make this argument stronger because otherwise we wouldn't, need, uh, wouldn't win it. And one of the key questions is really, you know, can we, what's going on in the world? And, and we know that in Berlin or in Central Europe, we easily um, could argue, well, do we need new buildings? You know, don't we have enough? Uh, isn't it time to, to stop constantly plastering new buildings within cities and around cities? I know it's a tough, tough call for, uh, for you guys. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's an argument that I don't, fully endorse myself, but, but that is, uh, has certain reason and legitimacy. But if you take a global perspective, um, that argument falls to pieces because we have, particularly in the global south and sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia, we have the most dramatic and fast uh, urbanization rate that ever existed on the planet. We're expecting 2.5 billion new urban inhabitants until 2050. And they won't change European cities or cities of the developed uh, world or the industrialized uh, states, but they will, this transformation will take place in uh, countries like Tanzania or Nigeria that will produce the biggest cities that we've ever known. And, um, and already we know that in more than a billion people in the global south live in completely inadequate conditions. Cities need retrofitting, infrastructural fittings, 
and act dignified um, housing for the existing populations and new populations. So it's a gigantic building project that, that will take place. If it takes place based on the materials, steel and concrete, we are likely to run towards three degrees. Whatever else we do, however much we cycle or uh, change our lifestyles, mobilities in the global north, this is this, is, this massive change process um, has in itself the energy to bring the entire planetary system to collapse, or could it be a process of, of healing in the sense that I described? <clears throat> a key question that comes next is, well, do we actually have enough biogenic materials? Can this biogenic material really match the urbanization, this gigantic urbanization demand? We um, more than doubled our population since the 1960s on the planet. We know that we will grow somewhere. We are now 8 billion. We will definitely grow to, towards 10 billion. Um, we more than doubled the wood consumption globally. Uh, the forest areas massively shrank. And we have bio-based materials being the hope um, of many sectors to change towards sustainability. We even have, I mean, it's crazy in my opinion, but we have even in the energy sector, people that argue, well, it's better to use wood or pellets um, for uh, fuel or energy consumption, heating, cooking, more than half of the uh, wood chops uh, and uh, log trees in Africa are used for cooking and, and heating. But we have also, particularly in recent years, a huge uptake of demand in the paper and paperboard industry, bioplastics, textiles, chemistry, all, all these sectors are majorly invested in the climate crisis as emitting sectors, and they all pin their hopes towards bio-based materials uh, to turn, to decarbonize and, um, and, uh, and get net, net zero. So can we actually pile on top of that, the construction sector? <clears throat> and it's complicated. Um, it's not an easy story. I mean, John Schellenberg would say there's maybe 10% of hope that we have, but let's, let's do it. Let's try. There's a huge gap, potential supply gap that exists in certain places, but there's an abundance in other places. And of course, mostly it depends on how we, we manage those kind of forests. You know, it could easily develop into a new and much more devastating extractive economy, uh, like uh, the way we um, extract fossil-based materials or, or rare earth and minerals. But it also has a potential, and I will continue with a slightly more positive narrative from now on, it has a potential to do otherwise. And I like this quote from the WWF, um, the market for wood can motivate good forest stewardship that can safeguard and expand a critical resource and protects forest values, or it can destroy the very places where wood grows. <clears throat> there are studies that would argue that we actually have enough degraded areas where wood has been cut down, forests have been cut down, which are not used for agriculture to feed the expanding global population, <clears throat> which, which have the potential for afforestation and huge um, uh, potential also to provide for all these kind of competing sectors uh, enough resources if trees are planted and maintained properly. And there was a recent study that also John Schellenberg was part of and um, Abhishek Mishra, Mishra was the main lead author that actually looked at all the different kind of land types globally and, um, and uh, found that actually um, uh, <clears throat> only uh, pastures and rangelands sort of used for cows, sheep, you know, meat production, only that would actually slightly suffer in the scenario uh, where we would massively increase uh, afforestation and, um, and sustainable harvesting of wood. So if we eat less meat, we can easily accommodate the space the earth needs in order to create this huge afforestation program. <clears throat> but then, of course, we also want to work not only 
in forestry or land use changes, and uh, we also want to consider the complexities of our societies. And we feel this in Berlin and uh, in the global space, it's much more dramatic. How, how do we overcome conflicts between ecological and social transformation to sustainability goals? Um, I already mentioned the dramatic demand for adequate uh, housing globally, but if we follow the discussions in Berlin or German cities as well, which are in need of affordable housing and very easy. I mean, it's the first thing that goes out of the window is uh, constructing with wood or other bio-based materials because we apparently can't afford it. It makes things more expensive. So these things are being pitched against each other, which is, which is very dramatic. And uh, we need to find ways of actually combining, bringing this kind of material changing the legislative and financial kind of framework in order to make this material viable for construction, also for the disadvantaged and, and needy and poor. And we need to uh, bring all the kind of sophistication that we have and that we need to do anyway together uh, in terms of mitigation. <clears throat> we know that we, need, we have uh, mobility transitions, energy transitions uh, in cities, um, adaptation, we know that cities need to become greener, we need to de-seal surfaces, we need to uh, keep water in the city to ensure that the infrastructural systems don't collapse in extreme weather and that, that uh, evaporation adds to cooling, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and we need to add this kind of component of just transitioning um, to ensure that these, uh, these uh, changes um, that we need to fight for in the city um, actually don't leave anyone behind. And we know the kind of images um, that are being developed and tested, and projects that are being tested, and how the potential, how that can change urban spaces. Berlin is by no means um, a kind of front runner in this kind of game. We have much more interesting cities also in Europe and actually Asia that, that test much more radical solution to turn uh, traffic space, car space, parks, roofs, etc., into much more complex nature and people-like spaces. <clears throat> and, um, and we also are obviously concerned that uh, we have an overload of change agendas. We have a very kind of often demotivated, badly capacitated, badly resourced um, uh, city environments. And, um, and we need to find ways of actually bringing this kind of story and this narrative to those who need to hear, to the industry, um, to people like you, to uh, city governments, to regional governments, um, to <coughs> developers, implementers, and the broader society. And this is actually taking quite a lot of time that we don't have at Bauhaus Earth to somehow play different, um, uh, try to generate impact amongst different crowds. We were part of the Bündnis für Bezahlbarer Wohnraum, the Alliance for Affordable Housing in Germany, which is our minister for building here. We organized a big conference in Rome with Ursula von der Leyen and um, again our minister and many really interesting uh, academics and practitioners from around the world. <clears throat> and, um, and we speak at G7, we develop protocols and uh, agendas uh, for turning our vision into, into reality and we are just at the beginning of it. And um, we want to further develop sort of co-learning processes to place this narrative um, uh, in, um, in change agendas or decarbonization processes in cities, which are so far mainly about traffic and energy and not really about building materials. Uh, we are publishing, uh, developing sort of knowledge tools. And, and this is what I want to talk um, last, uh, we want to develop labs because we think that just producing paper reports or kind of advocacy work uh, doesn't suffice and we need to show how it can be done differently and we need to align ourselves with the many people that do this on the regular basis. So we have our lab actually ourselves in Berlin. This is in the south of Berlin in the so-called Marine Park. It's a former now listed building that was servicing the gas works um, in the vicinity and we are turning this into a space of experimentation around bio-based materials. And we had the chance to collaborate a few weeks ago with the Institute of Advanced, um, uh, the Institute of Advanced Architecture, uh, Catalonia, IAC in Barcelona, 
who have been building up a lab actually for the last 15 years, a very interesting lab, so they're way ahead of us. Um, they invited us to, to join in this quite symbolic intervention. I'm sure you recognize this. It's the Mies van der Rohe Barcelona Pavilion. <clears throat> so together with IAC, we were invited to um, uh, place an alternative structure into this arrangement. You can just about see it here. It's peeping over the edge. <clears throat> and, um, and here we used entirely bi-based kind of regionally available materials such as mass timber and played with the aesthetics and the proportions and the possibilities uh, that, of course, Mies had with these uh, uh, mineral-based materials and made this whole experience, this dialogue between these two different structures, um, a kind of dialogue about carbon. <clears throat> it's pretty mean, of course, because, you know, uh, the, the, the nutrients here are, are devastating when you think about it, you know, where the material traveled from and uh, how it was assembled, et cetera, et cetera. And we can roughly calculate this um, and obviously come up with a huge kind of carbon spike that made this beautiful structure possible. Um, <clears throat> and um, which obviously needs to perform much, much more than our temporary structure, but uh, nevertheless, it was an important intervention, uh, symbolic intervention, uh, a first, hopefully, of a whole series that we want to propagate um, that showed how building otherwise could, could look like, or the aesthetic could look like, how you can actually engage in a critical dialogue with also the legacy of uh, fossil-based kind of modernity. And this sort of experimentation takes place globally. Um, the super interesting alliances of sometimes with architects, sometimes activists, sometimes planners, biologists, chemists that are rediscovering, in a sense, regional uh, building traditions. It could be adobe, it could be um, uh, bamboo. Uh, we are partnering with a super interesting uh, environmental bamboo foundation who uh, attempt to, or who have developed a very simple technology of compressing bamboo into a generic building block that can then be glued into any kind of shape and size. And we are trying to think through ways of making this experimentation um, to pull it out of this sort of uh, intellectual, academic, uh, kind of activist corner and sort of create ways of making those kind of experimentation and form scalable um, uh, uh, approaches to planning and, and building production. Um, and we have to constantly kind of remember the, it's not just a, a kind of crazy idea and, uh, or a kind of fetishism of climate scientists about this carbon storage. I mean, the benefits of bio-based materials are multiple. Of course, uh, we are, our entry point is the environmental uh, benefits um, that are already talked about that are, are listed here, but also we have Actually, in many countries around the world, particularly in those countries which are poor, which have not had um, a fair share in the fossil-based kind of global economy, it has a chance to rejuvenate local value chains and uh, livelihood uh, building because <clears throat> these materials can be harvested and maintained and also processed by, by rural populations, by um, if if uh, the right kind of job creation and upskilling programs um, are being developed, it can bring people into jobs. Uh, they are labor intensive, which is what many of these uh, economies want and need. Um, and they have a huge benefit for health and well-being. Uh, they smell nice, they feel nice, they have an amazing capacity that you all know about to adapt to climate, to heat, to, to cold. Um, and um, produce good indoor quality and air quality and uh, uh, produce a sort of beautiful, dignified um, environment that also speaks to um, local traditions and local identities and diversities around the world. So this kind of um, experimentation and how that could inform a new practice is something we want to help promote by um, uh, starting hopefully next year uh, a global regenerative building challenge. We sit at uh, the tap of a lot of resources and green capital in the center of Europe here in Berlin that we want to channel to help these guys uh, to actually develop this experimentation into scalable 
uh, businesses that can really make difference at scale. And I want to end up by just coming back to, do I have another five minutes or so? Um, I want to end up coming back to, to us and what, what we could do here and what this whole idea of actually switching the building sector and the building economy towards uh, something that could be called bio-based, regional-based, circular. This is the kind of material we have, right? The, the Brandenburg or the Märkische Kiefer, the Brandenburg pine. Um, it's not a material that you could call kind of indigenous or, or natural. What is natural um, is actually, uh, it makes up most, most of the forest reservoir, but it, it is a material that is comparatively young in, in the sense or in the extent to which it shapes our landscapes around Berlin. <clears throat> This was a traditional kind of uh, forest, but uh, mainly during the First and Second World War, rapid industrialization, uh, bombing, uh, uh, war destruction, and reparation, deforestation that was part of reparation programs. Entire forests were cut down and then shipped to Russia. Um, this kind of natural uh, biosphere uh, was replaced by timber plantations. Uh, the kind of stuff that, that you, you see when you go for a swim in one of the lakes. Um, this is kind of very recent stuff. It's anthropogenic kind of plantations, you could say. And they're very fragile, and they burn. And there's ammunition still on the ground. As you know, you know when, 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 when fire starts, it kind of in certain corridors where, where bombers in the Second World War uh, entered or exited Berlin, uh, there are millions of unexploded devices still on the ground that pop. And, uh, and amplify the fire. So we, and, uh, and we know the droughts, uh, we know the um, fragility of this kind of plantation. Uh, it, it's a desperate need of investment and of restructuring. And um, we are speaking a lot to forest owners um, who struggle, even those who are uh, motivated to uh, restructure the forests uh, to make it more diverse, less uh, less um, fragile towards uh, drought and, um, and uh, all kinds of insect attacks. Um, but they lack money, they lack resources, they, um, they suffer from an overpopulation of, uh, of uh, wild boar and deer. Um, so uh, many of them would be desperate for, for people who are actually engaging in hunting uh, and eating red meat, uh, so you can think about that. Um, but so this is the kind of uh, system, this is the sort of starting point in a sense. What do we have, you know, and what, what does it need and can this kind of transformation of the, the biosphere around Berlin that needs to happen, it will not, the, the, the Brandenburg pine will not survive climate change here. So we need to invest in reforestation and stabilizing um, the biosphere and turning these huge fields of, uh, you know, the legacy of East German industrial agriculture um, into um, smaller patches with agroforestry strips in between that keep water and, uh, and prevent uh, um, uh, uh, winds from uh, you know, causing erosion. And it's, it's very complicated, it's super interesting. It's not really on the radar of architects, right? But we should worry about this. This is kind of where the material that we need to build with comes from. And, uh, and, and this is where, where this kind of regenerative building change uh, should start. Um, and uh, so this is actually the work of one of our uh, youngest staff. He's uh, still a student and he's working, he's doing his master thesis uh, as part of the Bauhaus team, Christian Goethe, um, who sort of looked at um, the, let's say, political economy of, of the Brandenburg Forest and, um, and all its kind of complication and the barriers that are standing in the way of uh, shifts towards uh, uh, restructuring those forests in a sustainable way. And, 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 and the next thing is, of course, you know, how, wh why does this kind of material uh, that will not uh, be very carbon intensive to bring it into the city, why does it not arrive in the city? We have uh, eight of the largest um, European uh, sawmills in Brandenburg as a consequence of a um, particular economic policy in Brandenburg that really uh, preferenced uh, those large producers over smaller, medium-sized uh, uh, businesses. 
and they have licenses to cut most of this stuff and ship it to Canada and to uh, Australia. So, so this kind of material that, that could actually speak to our local demand is not arriving here. Uh, instead, it's caught up in, in a very erratic, uh, disjointed, um, um, volatile global market. And the, the, the dramatic rise in, in prices is not due to a lack of availability. It's, it's a product of an erratic, uh, dysfunctional market. Um, and of course, we, we also have to kind of acknowledge <clears throat> you know, that these urbanization pressures in Berlin and Brandenburg create very uneven kind of landscapes, socially, economically, and, and uh, creating approaches in which we, we actually bring uh, value generation to uh, villages and remote uh, towns uh, further away from Berlin and create value there and, um, and upskill local population and help to... Um, uh, build livelihoods there, it will also help uh, to ease pressure from Berlin and create a more equitable kind of urban-rural relationship. I have to come to an end, but, but this is, of course, uh, the stuff that we then need to, to do. We need to bring this material into, into the city, and, um, and you are, as designers uh, here, uh, very well familiar with the challenges that these materials pose in terms of the regulatory barriers we face, you know, the, I think, completely unjust um, advantages that concrete and steel have in the sense that they are not really pay, need to pay for the follow-up costs uh, uh, if you take in environmental damage. So we need a level playing field. That is uh, the role for politics to establish this, and instead we are, we are getting a Muster Holzbau Richtlinie that, um, that I think many of you will probably know and struggle with that uh, is anything but encouraging building with wood because it forces us to actually uh, encapsulate uh, wooden structures with gypsum and uh, carbon intensive materials and all the environmental gains are gone. So, um, but we have to remember that that you know, there is also here a fantastic tradition of actually, and this is uh, not a Bauhaus building, but it comes from that time. I'm sure many of you know Konrad Baxmann's Einstein House in Kaput near Potsdam. It's a beautiful kind of tradition uh, that we can build on and refer to. And uh, next year, we want to build uh, Barcelona II, as it were, um, a first experimental pavilion in the center of Potsdam called Proto Potsdam. And we want to show there in a gap um, between buildings, you know, how building with 100% regenerative buildings from the region and waste streams uh, could look like. And we want to, this is not what it's going to look like, it's just a placeholder. It will probably not be pink. Um, but we want to create here a place to meet, uh, gather, debate about uh, Bauwende building change. And also, uh, this will be an extension of our lab to test, test materials. We'll be inviting offices like you, um, industry, to use this kind of structure to test um, uh, new ways of building and, approach, uh, and building approaches and assembly approaches. And eventually, hopefully, once we got uh, the probably 20 million euros necessary together, we want to uh, use this as a kind of our main uh, home uh, of Bauhaus Earth in Potsdam, uh, reusing the materials that we played with here um, and uh, this will take probably a few years, but hopefully we will manage. Um, so that's all for me. Um, if you want to read more about us, we have a great website um, designed by and with Send Receive, who is also working with Hen, I think. And uh, in it, you also find um, a charter which we co-authored uh, earlier this year called Charter for the City and the Planet, which summarizes some of our vision of what the built environment globally should turn into. And I look forward to the discussion and your questions. Thanks. Um, good evening from, from my side also. Um, my name is Marlene. Thank you, um, Martin, Giovanni, Nina, for the invitation. It's a, it's a special honor and a treat for me to um, be here a little bit at the intersection of my uh, former and current professional homes. So thank you very much. Thank you, Philip, for um, this great lecture. Um, I have 
a lot of questions, and I, I'm very curious to hear what the three of you think about these topics and how they link in your um, daily work, but also in different visions for the future. But um, maybe let's first open um, the floor for um, questions from the audience. I'm sure there are a few here also. I believe we have a microphone. Yeah, so you can raise your hand and Nina will bring it to you. Yeah, here in the front. Hi, you hear me? Yeah. So first of all, thanks for the for the nice speech and the being on that mission, kind of to kind of bring us a bit more further to this topic, cities of carbon sinks. Um, what I would be interested, because I have the feeling architects usually like to think in that way. Where do you kind of meet on your mission the biggest points of resistance? Is it in politics? Is it on how the laws are made? Where do you have the feeling it's the biggest resistance by develop, developing your idea? Um, to be honest, I don't know yet. Uh, we are quite young. Uh, but, I mean, well, I sometimes call it sort of path dependency. It's a bit of a funny term, but uh, you know what I mean. I mean, we are, we are rolling and we, we have an entrenched way of doing things. Um, and that sustains a particular economy and very powerful kind of actors. I think, this, I think economic actors are probably the, the most difficult to persuade, to actually let go. Um, because they're, they're losses, uh, they're losers in this kind of transformation. Uh, you know, we have a, a very aggressive cement lobby and, uh, and <laughs> concrete lobby that is constantly t trying to tell us it's not actually so bad. And, you know, we can have uh, green concrete, no worries, and, you know, just wait a bit. And, um, you know, I, I do think that it's, it's very tough. And, and uh, you know, particularly when we, you know, it, and, and it's not just evil corporate bosses, you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, a kind of conspiracy theorist at all, but it's, it's, it's a value chain that is very entrenched. And in a city like Dar es Salaam also, you know, you, you have, you know, people who run these businesses, um, uh, you know, it goes down into cities and it's becoming part of the neighborhood. So, uh, you know, builders who, who push certain building techniques because they've done it for the last decade. So how do you, how do you get around that? Um, how do you persuade people to, to switch and to let go and to, uh, you know, not everybody I think can, so there will definitely be some users and I think we need to, as architects, as uh, also end users of the stuff, we need to, um, yeah, simply reject what is being offered and what's no longer viable. Um, and then, of course, I could go on and on about, you know, why the political level is not faster and, uh, and uh, sluggish, as it were, and uh, you know, where are the excuses to, to uh, now in, in Germany you know, to, to actually really accelerate the process of rewriting building regulations and make, giving really a, a level playing field to these kind of materials, which there isn't at all. So I'm not letting architects off the hook uh, at all, but uh, Let's, let's get to that in a second. <laughs> when, when talking about um, the economic pressure, I'm sure this is an issue for you guys as well, right? Because we, we always talk about the politicians and they're so slow and we need to do more advocacy and so forth, but you're obviously um, you know, some, somehow dependent on, on the clients as well, right? So where, um, how does this speak to, to you and, and your work and where do you see a responsibility on the side of the clients and where do you see your responsibility as designers in architecture practice? Well, I mean, I, I think we're, we're dependent on the clients, but I think that everybody, a lot of the clients that we interact with, they have the motivation to go in the right direction. Mm -hmm. I think, I agree with Armin, I think that <clears throat> I think we all, we all appreciated the speech. I think it's, it's a fantastic mission they, 
that you're in. I think for, for, for the colleagues here, I think you didn't make any convert because they, they, most of our colleagues, they already are, are aware of the issue, maybe, um, and we're struggling in finding the solutions. And the issue often times is not even the clients that want to uh, go along, but it's the, it's the regulations that lag behind. Like you say, the, there is not really uh, a way that wood is, that our, our current standard don't make it easier for wood to be used without additional material, without incurring additional cost. And there is the issue of legacy of the industry that has already a lot of investment in certain processes. And of course, the construction industry is an industry that notoriously runs on very small margins. So there is not the incentive on, on for, for innovation, for radical innovation, is, is unfortunately not there as we would like to be. And there is always the issue of um, clients uh, or first movers, no? How do we go for buildings that uh, we want those to be robust entities that last for the next 20, 50, maybe 100 years even. And of course there is huge risk associated with experimenting with new techniques, whether, whether the risk is real or perceived. Yeah. Well, but at the same time, um, so I'm, you don't misunderstand me, I'm, I'm not letting architects off the hook either. Um, <laughs> so I think that although as narrow the kind of wiggle room might be that we have with clients, with budgets, etc. You know, I don't think uh, all practices really use it uh, to its full potential. And um, and I think we have a huge, huge responsibility and trust to kind of steer this and uh, nudge this uh, building change that we need uh, further. And I know it has to be a combination of top down and, and bottom up. And architects are probably a little bit more part of the bottom up. Uh, uh, although they always feel that they are, you know, the center of society and uh, all this. But, um, you know, bottom up is also very important. We can't, we need uh, proofs of concepts. We need um, evidence that we also need actually to experiment with the aesthetics of this new material to make it actually speak to, to clients better. Because I think, uh, and stepping out of maybe the Berlin bubble again, you know, when, when, when we work in the global south, natural material such as, timber or adobe, um, they, they have a very bad connotation They're associated with backwardness, with poverty. Um, so all people aspire to, uh, particularly low middle classes, middle classes, uh, is steel and concrete, a modern yeah. house. You know, the kind of images that we helped as an architectural community in the north produce. And, uh, and so how do, how do we, you know, and that is the difference at scale that we need, yeah. right? So we need, and for that we need really good um, evidence that yeah. it's actually possible. And I think, and, and then architects have all the tools to make it beautiful. Yeah. yeah. I think you said a very important word there, this, this topic of aspiration. And mm -hmm. I think that, that this, this aspirational image that is associated with certain vision of what is progress, what is success, what yeah. is success. Yeah. And going back to, to me as no, we, we're still living in the, in, the, in, in the reflection of that image that was created in a period where um, the energy crisis wasn't really, the, the, the environmental crisis wasn't really on the, on the radar or on the agenda, wasn't fully understood the consequences of a certain uh, drive towards standardization, homogenization. No? You, you find the same building in New York as in Berlin, yeah. as in Jakarta, um, and, and they all reflect still that image. So I think the, one of the way I see it, one of the biggest missions that we have as architects is creating the new aspirational image that instead of being uh, somehow rooted in extractive and fossil driven economy is, is rooted in a bio-based regenerative yeah. I mean, paradigm. We, um, we like architects, we are partly uh, <laughs> ourselves architects, we like to hang out <laughs> with architects, but at the same time, we have to also be acutely aware, and we have to, we are discussing this a lot at Bars Earth, that we have to speak to other producers of built environment. You know, as architects, we have uh, a significant but, but not complete control of this. Um, so, so we need to 
have dialogues with large developers, with kind of industry that produces uh, prefabricated elements and systems um, that uh, in this kind of high um, uh, priced kind of environment uh, like, like Germany or Central of Europe is probably the only way to actually reduce cost and make uh, produce uh, housing situations that are affordable. So architects, or many architects, work in a very kind of situative way and a uh, very local way and can have the ability to produce very beautiful stuff which has a super, super important role to play as a kind of reference, as a way to develop the aesthetics, the aspiration, as you say. But we need to, we don't have time until that trickles up. Uh, we need to go to these big producers um, and the big industry and uh, who develop systems to, that have the capacity to renovate the entire building stock of uh, Germany. Yeah. And um, yeah, and we are trying to kind of find ways of talking to these guys and, uh, and we are yeah, constructing some kind of partnerships with them. We will see whether, what we manage. <laughs> and so talking about these um, local solutions, local aspirations, um, I wonder what about the global scale, right? Because HEN is a global practice with um, offices in China as well, many international projects. And um, Bauhaus Earth has, uh, is also already, in its, uh, in, after two years of existence, uh, quite international in its scope. And I wonder, um, where do you see the differences in the discourses on sustainability, for instance? How is it different um, in the Chinese market compared to the German market, for instance? And, um, and maybe you, Philip, for, 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 or for us at Bauhaus Earth, how can we as an organization based in Berlin and Potsdam in the maybe you know, very privileged northern, um, western kind of context somehow contribute and help these other global contexts? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, if I may, may jump in, I, as you mentioned before, no, I think the, the awareness and the aspiration is definitely here. Um, but also, as you said, that alone doesn't um, heal the planet. No, we need to um, take action. And here I still see somehow a very big gap no, between the theory, which I, I was very impressed uh, by your thoughts and your ideas and, and the practice. No? And building at larger scales um, um, is always a high risk for uh, a client. So um, creating that exact evidence, no, I think, is still <laughs> ahead of us, um, even here um, in, in the Western world. And when it comes to um, um, contexts like China, um, it's even more difficult you know, because for many of our Chinese clients, sustainability still is something that you add on, something that complicates things, something that makes it uh, more expensive. So, uh, and also the construction industry is um, still uh, mainly on concrete. So um, over there, um, the again, aspiration is, might be the same, but it's much more difficult to, uh, to implement it. And you as an architect, um, fall much more into the role of um, a communicator, an educator, someone who's trying to convince uh, the opposite side. You know? mm. So that to me would be the main, main difference, but even with everyone being on the same page here, it's still, uh, and that's maybe where you guys um, are crucial as, a, um, as an institution, you know, to bridge the gap between the architects, the clients, the industries, and the political um, framework. Mm. Yeah, that's... Uh, I, I would agree. I mean, we are finding a useful place, let's say, to or useful gap to fill, and we are experimenting uh, with different uh, levers. Uh, uh, but I agree. I mean, we are Bars Earth is not uh, uh, like an architecture office. We have to we have to sort of somehow be complementary to you guys and uh, shout this kind of story to into the political space uh, and uh, towards all these other often much more powerful kind of actors that produce our built environment. Um, but back to, to Malin's question about uh, sustainability, I think, in, I mean, working in Sub-Saharan Africa for a number of years, also pre Bahas Earth, um, I always found that um, transformation sustain sustainability or SDGs, or it, was, it arrived, but it was a very intellectual kind of debate. And 
uh, whereas the majority of, of the populations are really struggling with a developmental agenda. So um, although many cities in Sub-Saharan Africa are suffering from climate change much more than, than cities in Europe, um, the climate narrative is not uh, really part of local priorities. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, we have a great collaborator and friend, Edgar Peterson, he says, Philip, you know, we'd love to cooperate with you guys, but whatever we do, it has to create jobs. Mm -hmm. That's the reality. So, uh, so and that's, that's, I think that's why we speak of a regenerative, building environment really very consciously sort of bringing in these kind of social aspects. And, um, and we have to sort of fold in ideas of uh, uh, carbon uh, saving, carbon substitution and storage um, into trajectories that allow people to grow, also to build and to, to develop. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we have to be very careful because we, we are indeed, I mean, you mentioned this notion of kind of uh, colonial or neo-colonial posturing. Um, this is how we are often perceived as, you know, now kind of wagging the finger, um, the environmental kind of uh, finger, and mm -hmm. and telling people again what to do. Um, still emitting per capita, uh, you know, ten t tens of times more carbon than uh, populations in the global south, and telling them, sorry, you know, you missed the boat. That's all. Uh, we all shared out uh, the riches, uh, no space for you. So this doesn't work. And I think China is kind of playing a sort of ambivalent role also in, in the COP process. Uh, there was a lot of struggle. China, for convenience uh, sake, would love to keep this developing nation status mm -hmm. um, to be shedding itself of responsibility, of paying into uh, 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 compensation or um, uh, funds, um, I think this is no longer possible. Mm -hmm. um, so I really hope that uh, China owns up to its own responsibilities. Um, it, it did, I mean, I followed, I also worked in China uh, a few years back before COVID and, uh, and certain shifts and policy changes were quite impressive mm -hmm. um, that were able to be implemented much faster and quicker. Um, for instance, mobility changes, and uh, yeah, we really hope that um, obviously this whole narrative doesn't work without China, so it has to be part of it. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have another question from the audience here in the front? And then, yeah. Kind of, uh, first of all, really good lecture and, uh, and really insightful, but connected to what you're uh, saying actually right now with the carbon colonization in a way that we, we've already shared the, the good piece. How can we impact the cities of the future that, that are the megalopolis that you mentioned in Tanzania, in Laos, in, in Nigeria, which are going to be growing at much faster rates than, for example, our current cities? whereas we already struggle with, with the cities that we have. We, we can't really implement the changes here fast enough to, to act. How can we change the, the mentality in, regi in regions and implement our solutions to help them grow more sustainable cities at the scale that we haven't really encountered so far in, in where we live already? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, that's the million dollar question. You know, how to steer, how to make that huge and fast wave of urbanization and steer it in some kind of uh, way that it doesn't become a completely destructive ravaging force um, destroying the planet. And <clears throat> yeah, and we need to act uh, extremely fast. Um, uh, we have to acknowledge that in many of these environments, the steering capacity uh, of governments or whether at the national scale or the city scale is, is very minor because most of this urbanization process, actually 70% globally, uh, is taking place in a sort of informal context. It's of course not informal in the sense of not organized and not economically thought through, but it doesn't follow a kind of top-down planning framework. Um, so I think that, that this argument needs to be brought to the people as much as possible. Um, uh, who are, I mean, there's a, we, we know that uh, mega cities stabilize, you know, at a certain point, uh, you know, uh, people acknowledge the kind of difficulties um, of navigating 
large cities and uh, other urban patterns emerge. Um, so if you look more closely at the um, Abuja, uh, Lagos, Abidjan corridor, which is uh, going to be the biggest city on the planet uh, in a couple of decades with 100 million people, is actually an interesting fabric. It's a, it's a polycentric structure. It's not just one big city. It's actually an, a mesh of quite intricate, kind of locally managed uh, cities with a lot of farming uh, in between. Um, it's, it's, it's a kind of urban type that doesn't really match uh, what we know in Europe. And we have to, we can't, certainly what we cannot do is to apply a sort of images or concepts of European cities to this kind of fabric. We have to kind of work with what is there and, and maybe uh, help people to actually nurture and stabilize these kind of uh, ecosystem um, elements that, that are part of this urban fabric. And um, yeah, and the economic argument is crucial. Um, Bio-based circular economies have to create jobs and local value generation. And I really believe it's possible and we need to prove this much more and sell the story much more. Hi, um, Arlen Stewas with Gensler. Uh, we, uh, we're seeing an enormous uptick of ESG reporting globally with a lot of our clients. We're also seeing an enormous uptick of a demand for certifications for buildings that we're designing. My question for you is, or, or all of you, is what do you see as some of the low-hanging tax incentives that can start to support some of these changes locally, maybe regionally, and throughout Europe? So a, a tax incentive being uh, something like the mansard roof, for example, avoiding uh, a floor area ratio, for example, on the roof and, and, and creating an incentive for increased floor area ratio, for example. Does that make sense? What, are, what, are, what do you see as some low-hanging fruit tax incentives to influence timber frame construction, low carbon materials, redesigning the supply chain, for example? What do you think are some low-hanging It's Opportunity. Uh, it's a very interesting question, and I, I think it has to be answered in according to very sp specific contexts, right? I think in in Germany, I think demolition, the waste of grey energy, has to be made very expensive. Uh, I think that all the building elements that tend to need uh, concrete and steel, such as huge foundations and uh, basements and uh, subterranean kind of structures have to be uh, made very expensive. Um, so I think truly kind of carbon neutral building kind of, or carbon negative building, is, this is what we want, um, a building that actually stores carbon rather more than it emits. Um, in our kind of climate, in our world, it's only possible if you actually reduce the foundation to a ground slab that could even be eventually possibly compressed earth or other kind of reinforced material. So um, I, I'm not a purist in a sense that I say, don't ever touch concrete or steel again, uh, but we have to just consider that material so uh, precious that we have to reduce it to the absolutely essential parts and all all these kind of building elements that tend to only work on this basis basically have to be made insanely expensive. Um, it's not really lower hanging fruit because it's kind of painful, I guess. Um, it has uh, consequences. Um, and uh, many of our kind of master plans or uh, Bebauungspläne, whatever, they're not made for that. You can't, because they have, they're rigid and fixed and they're have a certain amount of car park uh, requirements and provision standards that can only be met when you build underground. So th the problem is we have a rigid planning framework that, that basically uh, uh, it kind of binds us in 10, 20 years um, of uh, deciding, uh, planning, uh, and then implementing. And, and this is not fast enough. So a low-hanging fruit would be to try to deregulate some of this stuff, uh, make it more flexible, consider planning uh, more open kind of frameworks, so new approaches, new materials, new technologies 
can find a much faster entry point, uh, and of course, the bio, biomaterials that I'm caring for. Um, what do you think? No, I think for one, one thing that you mentioned that I think is absolutely fundamental is the whole topic of making demolition a lot more expensive. I think also because uh, when we look at the global context, of course, we need to provide a massive amount of new buildings. But when we look at the European context, a lot of the built environment that we will need in the next 100 years is already what we have. So we need to find a way to decarbonize that to reuse that, to adapt it to the, to the needs of the future. And um, so, so I think that there are already um, ways uh, that, that, that the legislators are moving in this direction. So that there are things on the horizon at the European level in terms of this renovation wave that it's coming. So there is going to be a lot of money that is going to be put, especially in housing, to promote uh, improvement in energy performance. Um, there was a sort of a trial run of sorts in Italy in the past two years where Mario Draghi had a sort of uh, promoted a similar program that was highly successful because also unites the sort of um, the, the, these two topics, uh, job creation at a very low level, entry level, uh, skilling labors uh, in creating this sort yeah. of sustainable um, buildings um, and at the same time reducing the uh, energy demand. So there are those things, and I think um, I'm, I'm not going to, uh, I, I'm, I'm not a legislator or, 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 or somebody that is qualified to whisper in the ears of the politicians, but I see what, uh, what they're doing at the, at the sort of the roadmap that the European Union is doing too late, too slowly, but it's kind of going in the right direction. Also the whole topic of the EU taxonomy, uh, linking uh, access to finance to uh, a minimum of an agreed baseline of what constitutes a sustainable activity and a sustainable building. And we, we are already seeing the impacts of this legislation that partially is announced and not fully enforced um, on our projects, on, on the way clients uh, approach us. So I think but, that is very interesting. Yeah, but low hanging fruits is definitely in legislation, regulation, procurement. I mean, this, this doesn't cost anything. Mm. It can have huge impact. Uh, it's of course also necessary to throw money at this and to uh, fund uh, transitions, but why do we need to encapsulate uh, uh, structural cores of timber, which is perfectly possible to have them exposed in Switzerland or Austria? Uh, why do we do that in Germany? It's insane. Um, why do we um, not uh, you know, allow wood, which is actually burning much more controllably, much, much more uh, controllably than steel, uh, for instance, steel structures. You know, why, why are they, um, why, do they, why do we need to meet insane kind of uh, cost driving kind of uh, fire regulation requirements uh, in wood? So all this kind of stuff needs to change very quickly and they, it reduces cost uh, and incentivizes people without actually investing a single euro in, uh, in this. So, so that is definitely my, my uh, the way I would argue for low hanging fruits. So we have a question from, from you, Nick. Um, but I also see that we're already past time, so maybe we can collect this question and one or two from the audience and then have a last round of answers. Um, Okay, so we have a few here. Okay, so yeah. let me first um, read the one from Dinesh. Hi, Dinesh. Um, Dinesh is from India and um, writes, I have personally worked with similar architectural style and I felt or I feel like the biggest trouble for us as architects is to fight with the current cultural practice in terms of time and market opportunities. Do you feel this style could cope up with all time constraint and be durable with current lifestyle? Let's follow up with just two questions and then we mm -hmm. have a round of answers. Hi. Um, so my question was kind of relating actually to a last, couple of the last questions, especially this is notion of steering, management, decision making and how one actually governs such a colossal task which I think this transition is. 
And there was, um, I think, a couple of diagrams. The first diagram, this process and flow diagram that you had, which showed a, like, kind of a local solution as to how to solve the Brandenburg cycle. And then you also had the world map of urbanization as a contrasting image for kind of a global problem. And uh, what I found very interesting is how that related to this world map of reforestation. And I think what one has seen this year especially is how artificial intelligence in design is kind of taking a new force and also becoming like very, very powerful. I mean, if you look at things like mid-journey and things like that, and also the data sets that are um, equated with that. But um, one question I had, and now this is a little bit provocative deliberately, if you look at things like COP26, which is always an amalgamation of many nations, of peoples, uh, that often don't tend to be able to come to a, a non-biased or let's say a balanced decision because of the vested interests of the different parties. My question is kind of relating, do you see the potential of AI to be a non-biased decision maker that can then actually deal with the challenge of uh, the global problem? And then also, should we then maybe give that away, that decision making in order to actually <laughs> get some headway? It's a little, I told you it's provocative. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and now, now I will um, use my role as a moderator and I will be a cheap feminist and I invite the last question to come from a woman in the audience, please. <laughs> Hello, uh, I'm from uh, Jakarta, actually from Indonesia. I'm interested with, uh, with a topic that you present about uh, bio-based material. This is really interesting if I imagine that every city with different climate uh, characteristics will be have provide different uh, bio-based material because of response to the, the local climate things on, on the location. And if we are looking back on the vernacular settlement, for example, in my country, we have a lot of uh, built of uh, vernacular settlement that already built with the bio-based material, such as the bamboo and, and the rattan and others. And I just wondering that what would be the influence of the research of bio-based material related to the climate characteristic and also the needs of uh, current human um, moderniz modernization. For example, my country have a plan to relocate the capital city, uh, but at the end, uh, in Borneo, but at the end, uh, the, the design of the architecture in the location they still have a respond with the current human needs with the massive of building in the multiple multiple uh, floor. But at the previous in the vernacular settlement, they only have s small building scale of it. So I just wondering about the relationship of the bio-based material um, research in a, uh, related to the climate characteristic and also the current human needs of it. Thank you. So we have three questions <laughs> about um, constraints of time and resources, a, con a question about AI, and a question about um, material ecology, material research, but then also the scalability of um, the projects that can come out of this. So <laughs> who wants to start? <laughs> you have the choice. Three small questions. Yes. Um, no, I, th I think on the, um, I, I, I might start from the last one. Uh, or from in general, I think the, or, well, I think in general, maybe mixing the first and the last one. Um, but I think in general, one topic that I think is fascinating moving towards the future is this idea that um, so far we live in a culture where essentially there is a monoculture of building throughout the globe at the moment. And, and we, I hope we really we are going toward the sort of renaissance and rediscovering of a lot of different building techniques, sometimes with the use of uh, new technologies, like that there, there is a lot of very interesting work that is being done in 3D printing with rammed earth and with natural fibers, combining um, compressed earth and, and timber structures. And hopefully that will start to create this new language that then all of a sudden is also aspirational and, and desirable. And at the same time, I think in terms of um, readiness to respond, very often I think we, we could find a situation where we're actually building with natural material, all of a sudden we're building with much softer, much lighter materials. So also the terms, in terms of being quick to respond and being quick in, in building, sometimes those materials actually have a very strong advantage because they can be uh, worked in a much 
a much simpler way, uh, which doesn't mean it has to be less sophisticated. For instance, wood is fantastic because it's, it's both the most natural but also the most digital of materials because um, no, the, the way it is worked uh, in, in our context. So I think to, 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 to that question, I think we, we can provide quick response to, to those um, challenges with, the, 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 with natural material. The question is of course a question of scale and having the infrastructure that allows uh, these processes to be to be at the, at the scale, at the, the quantity that is needed mm. for the challenge. Yeah, I, I would agree that, that um, I mean, AI as a kind of, let's say, global governance model <laughs> seems to be a little bit dystopian to me. I, I believe that, <laughs> I believe we have to just figure it out ourselves, um, ultimately. Uh, but in terms of, um, being more intelligent than humans of reading the potential of bio-based material and uh, helping us to extract material in a much more intelligent way and to not, I mean, we have, we can't, I think, manage this kind of revolution in, in building by assuming that we can press nature into a kind of factory mode. Um, forests produce we have to learn, uh, a colleague of ours always says, we have to learn to listen to the forest. So AI could help us to do that, you know, it, uh, to understand what is available, you know, uh, rather than wanting to order standardized material, uh, we have to live with what nature produces. And we know from, from wood, and I'm not actually an expert, but I've been learning a lot about wood and how wasteful uh, our usage of it is um, because we often don't really understand it. Um, every wood is different. Every species is different. Has different properties. Can be used at different part of the building. And you know all this. Um, the industry is already, as you hinted, um, uh, very advanced, much more than other sectors uh, in terms of using digitalization and uh, and possibly also e AI. Yeah. Do you want to? No, nope. I mean, I like the question. Um, <laughs> maybe, yeah, it's a bit going a bit too far, but um, I would add to this question, maybe ask you, because I also, I liked the, the, the slide that you showed with the global kind of forestation, um, uh, this map. And here it seems to me, at least, that data is almost the precondition or the enabler, you know, to kind of operate on such a global scale, both on, you know, availability of materials, uh, their reuse, the... Um, um, kind of active you know, forestation of regions uh, across the planet. So, yeah, that um, I would ask to you is, is do you see that as a big leverage or an opportunity? Um, AI or? Da no, data. Da data, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I actually, yeah, as architects or also kind of urbanists, we tend to be a bit sniffy about data because we, we are sort of somehow used to work in this kind of very situative way and, um, and sometimes that perspective is a, is a little bit too small, actually. Uh, so that's what I found really interesting to work with climate scientists who are, who obviously work on very abstracted kind of, with abstracted kind of assumptions and models, but um, we need that way of seeing, actually. You know, we need to have this kind of planetary perspective and as architects, we. We're not the best at that. So, um, I mean, produce all kind of pseudo-scientific kind of uh, reports uh, mm -hmm. every now and then. But, uh, but we have to work with people that really know that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, sort of assessing resources and demands and simulating different uh, pathways and trajectories is, uh, can be done through these kind of tools. And mm -hmm. I think they're really necessary. Thank you. Well, I invite you to continue the conversation as we maybe share a drink now. Um, thank you to the panelists for the presentation, the invitation, the conversation. Um, and I wish you a, a good onward evening and conversation together. Thank you. Thank you.